Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one, Death World Veterans, written by Speed Hump 23. At a post-battle dinner, the leaders of the attacking armies of Tarita 2 were catching up over some fried tubers and watered down distilled liquids. The generals were debriefing each other over the different unit performances from the recent attempt to subjugate RIS-455, trying to see what went wrong. W-455 was a small agri-world, ripe for conquest. They had no standing army and only grew plants and consignments for other races. There was something about the light from their binary system that made crops grow fast and healthy. Southern Battle Group had some of the new mercs from the Death World Poply 5. The insectoid killers were born fighting their environment, given battle armor. They performed rather well. Until uh, Battle Group North had two detachments of Mechie units from Iron Reigns, an established merc group trained on some of the harshest Death Worlds in the sector. Their armor could crush any opposition in days. Until, that is... The general from the battle center group lumped in late. His legions of feline dragons had cleaned up most of the planet in the sector, and would have won the day on Russ 455 until their losses were absolute. They had not even made it to the surface, and the general's craft had only survived because he was leading from the rear. The plan was tried and true. Declare the invasion, demand total surrender, and endure a token 13% population reduction with the remaining natives turned into bonded slaves. Simply, until, that is, the natives said no. No one said no nowadays. The results of saying no was total reduction of population. So be it. The traditional two weeks' notice of extermination had been filed, and then, two weeks later, the next step was to capture the three main spaceports using the mercenaries, cleanse the indigenous populations from the nearby major cities, and then follow up with the rest of them. The generals regretted the cost of the extra ammunition involved with reducing the entire population, but no one said no to them until now. Two weeks had seen the natives scrape together a defense no one in the trip saw coming, and they had not done it alone. If the reports were to be believed, a small group of Terrans had helped defend the planet. The combined mercenary army had entered orbit, started to deploy to the three main spaceport zones, and died in flames and explosions. It did not make sense. All of the initial intelligence said that no external force was going to aid the natives of RIS-455. They simply did not have the funds to pay for an army the size suitable to withstand the combined Merc force. The guards came into the mess room and ordered the generals back to their cells. They were being treated well, as integral law dictated, Allowed to meet for mid-meals and speak freely. Even their wounds were being treated, following the standard conditions for such a hostile takeover failing. The surviving Merc units, which had taken part of the ill-fated attack, were now the property of RIS 455's government and would have to serve them for the next two standard generations. News was, they were already being trained in crop tending. The generals who had tried to capture the planet were being returned to their homeworld permanently, losing a sanctioned and declared war of conquest when there were the attackers was very embarrassing. The generals would be retired with full military pensions and then allowed to live out the rest of their days on their home planet. As the threat to planetary government had declared the war, they would be required to pay retribution to RIS-455 or surrender their home world to the victors. Luckily, while the government of Tractor to the RIS government were not making any extreme claims. The standard non-aggression pact for ten standard generations had been filed before the generals had left for home on the tribunal's guardship. The general of the Northern Falls sat down in his cabin and asked the guard, a Terran Marine, if he was a member of one of the units who had helped defend RIS-455. The Terran smiled. No, sir. He was employed by the Galactic Tribunal. The Terran Marines were the units of choice for those who could afford them. Growing up on a death world where they had been fighting amongst themselves for most of their history had bred the best warriors in the galaxy. 
The guard laughed and pointed out that no Terran Marine units had been involved, just a small team of mirror salesmen from down under. Hold on, the general said. Are not the Terran Marines the best fighting force in the galaxy? What unit of Terrans would have taken part with such great skills if not for the Terran Marines? Showing the general his datapad, the Terran Marine pulled out images of great forests of trees. The trees were about 40 meters tall and all had olive green slash gray leaves. See, these trees, they are gum trees. The Rus 455 crops are paid a pretty dollar per ton for their leaves. Why? Are they edible for humans or medicinal in nature? Not in the slightest. In fact, the only animal in the galaxy that can eat them are about 30 to 40 centimeters tall and sleep most of the day. I don't understand. You said that they are not edible, but some small animal does. Yes, sir. Believe me, we don't get it either. It was all over the local news nets last month. The Aussies had decided to sell Ris 455 agro companies to the latest in Terran solar mirror technology. These mirrors would allow the W455 AgriCore to increase yields in their crops by a significant magnitude, and the deal was to discount the leaf production for a few years. Your takeover was declared just as the Aussies had deployed their solar mirrors and were on ground setting up the control sites. If you had attacked straight away, you would have won, but you gave them two weeks to position the existing mirrors and deploy even more of them from their stockpiles. Your Merc troop ships were then trying to make planet fall while being sliced apart by reflected sunlight laser beams of such immense power that it is amazing any of your ships survived to crash land. A rather brilliant idea, if I do say so, but I hear that the lead technician is crediting an old sci-fi book he read a few years ago for the idea. The general looked at the guard with a puzzled look. You mean that they were not Terran marines? Who were they then? Let me spell it out. You all think Terrans grew up in a death world. That sounds scary. But in truth, we actually rather like the place in most cases. I grew up in the UK, where we like marine service. Because it gets us away from the fog and rain. But you pissed off a group of people who live in a part of the world that we all consider to be the most deadly place on our planet. Think about it. We think their country is death world compared to ours, and you piss them off by declaring war on the only other place in the galaxy that can grow food for one of their national icons. End of story. Story number two. Merchant Ship, written by Brew Fogger. Some things unknown about humans. The first was that they were very fond of big spacecraft. Most spacecraft are between 300 meters and 500 meters. Human spacecraft are between 1 kilometer to 40 kilometers. At least, that's what the reports say. Second, is that piracy is not common in human space or in trade routes, and they do not use the services of any Galactic Federation companies that provide the transport security service. So when we got news that the human spacecraft would dock at our station, we were happy because it was the first time many of us had seen one of their spacecraft. Before the human spacecraft had left subspace, we received a transmission asking for the exact orientation of our position in relation to the planet's gravity well, and if any objects were in orbit between the two bodies. Since we are the only thing between the planet, we gave them our position. Then the subspace window opens and the ship begins to cross very slowly. When our sensors were able to pick it up, we were surprised by the 1.5 kilometer long and 300 meter high spacecraft, armor so thick that our sensors couldn't detect even a sign of life. Dozens of plasma cannons lined up on the sides. In front and back were a huge warship where Aurora was the name of the ship. Our station was big, but not big enough for a direct docking. So they moved their ship into a close orbit and a smaller ship made the trip to us. As a station administrator, I was there when the captain entered our station. Captain Broderick was his name. He stated, as many routes are being attacked by piracy, humans and many governments decided that our station would be used as a main point of trade. Humans would bring the goods here, and other species would take them from here to whatever they wanted with the Federation escort. So I asked when the first shipment would arrive so that we could get ready. 
Now little ship will be the first. It was strange that they would ship goods in a warship. But not unheard of. No, Captain. When a civilian ship will take this route, I asked. I think there is a misunderstanding. My ship is a civilian ship. So you're saying the 24 plasma cannons on each side, five in the front, five in the back, and the dozen point defense weapons are just one civilian ship? Yes, mine is just a small merchant ship. Uh, those cannons are for defense only. If that was the defense of a small merchant ship, what was the defense of a warship? I dared ask. Well, uh, it was a long time ago when I was in the Navy, but uh, our ship would be considered the size of a small frigate in our Navy. But with half the guns, and in the battle group, there are destroyers, cruisers, and carriers, planes five times bigger than ours. And uh, there are, of course, our cruise ships that are even seven times bigger than our ship, and the planet crackers that I didn't even know how big they are. Planet crackers? When their need arises to break a planet, you don't want to invent a new class of ships, so we just built a few of them, you know, just in case. Uh, we found them to be very useful in mining operations. That night, I still had a few moments with the human captain and asked when the humans decided to put so many weapons on a merchant ship. Ah, you see, uh, my base ship is named after one that sailed the seas of our home planet many centuries ago. In fact, one of my great-great-grandfathers owned that ship. Even back then, we understood the need that our ships were protected from pirates and enemy factions. We only apply the same logic in space. After we discovered space piracy, it didn't take long for our prudence to pay off. It made me understand two things. Why humans don't have a problem with piracy... It's because no pirate would be crazy enough to face a ship this big with weapons most cruisers don't have. And second, because the other species requested a neutral port, who would want a merchant ship with the power of an armada delivering goods to their planet? End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian.